How good is it to worship our God this morning, church? Do you believe that? Do you believe that His presence is here? We're going to continue in our worship and we're going to do that through communion uh, right now. And so I'm going to ask you just to take a seat. And as you came in the door, um, you're given just a little cup with a little piece of wafer in it. You can start preparing that at home. Uh, I'm hoping you're joining us with communion. And if you haven't got that there, you run to the pantry, get whatever you can find out. Um, but I just want to share a few little things just before we, we take communion together. I was reading in Hebrews 12 too, And this is what it said, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the, uh, the perfecter of our faith or the finisher of our faith, for the joy set before Him endured the cross. For the joy set before Him endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I don't know if you've ever stopped and just dwell on what that was meaning, the fact of for the joy set before Him. Because if, if that was me, I don't think I'd have much joy leading into knowing what was ahead of me. But yet Jesus for the joy that was before Him. This is what Ephesians 2 says. See, once we were dead because of our disobedience and our many sins, you used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in this unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us, ourselves, myself, we used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were objects to God's anger, just like everyone else. But listen to what verse four says. This is what verse four says. But God, so rich in mercy, and He loved us so much that even though we were dead in our sins, even when we were against God, even when we were doing things on our, in our own ways, He gave us life when He raised Christ from the dead. Is that not amazing? So you've been saved by God's grace. That's how you've been saved. Verse 6 says, For He raised us from the dead along with Christ and has seated us with Him in the heavenly realms because we are united with who? Christ Jesus. Listen to verse 7. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of His grace and kindness towards us as shown in all He has done for us who are united in who? Christ Jesus. Listen to verse eight. God saved us by His grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things you've done. So none of us can boast about it. Verse 10 says, because you are God's Masterpiece. You know what a masterpiece is? It's a skillful piece of artistry. You this morning are God's masterpiece. And you know why there was joy that was set before Christ? Is because Christ knew that it was God's masterpiece who was going to be united with the Creator. And so he took that cross knowing that he was bringing back into restoration, creation to the Creator, not because of anything we have done. And the joy set before Him because glory goes to God because God says this in verse 7, says, so God can point to us in all future ages as examples of incredible wealth of His grace and kindness. See, God loves to pour out His grace and kindness. And that is the joy Jesus knew that this will bring great honour to our God. Do you know this morning, God didn't save you just because He was like, oh, I better do it. It was great joy He took in saving you this morning. And this is why we come and we take communion. 
It's because Jesus wanted us to remember that it was nothing to do with us, but to everything to do with Christ. And so on the night Jesus was betrayed, he was with his disciples and he took this bread and he broke it. And he says, this is my body, which is going to be given for you. I want you to eat this. And then in the same way, he took the cup and he says, this, this is my blood. This is a sign of the new covenant, meaning you have been saved by grace. You can come to God. Drink this in remembrance of me. And so we're going to do that right now as a church. I'm going to give you a moment. You can eat your bread right now. You can do that at home as well. You begin to thank God and say, God, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Maybe for you, this is a time when you want to sit before God and say, God, it has all been about me. Forgive me. I want to take hold of you again. Hold the cup and we'll drink together. stand with me, stand with me at home we're going to drink together in a sign of unity that we're unified in Christ and so let's do that and then we're going to worship our great God together, come on let's drink well Lord Jesus we want to thank you in the name of Jesus that we have been saved by grace Lord you have set us free and now we are seated, Lord we're beside you Lord, we're all glory and honour goes to you and I want to thank you Lord, for everything you have done. Lord, bringing people back to you, Lord. And we pray for more of that. Lord, we pray for more people to know it's not about works. It's about what you've done on the cross. Thank you for your resurrection. That means that you are alive and you are well and you are changing us. So now God be glorified and honoured in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Come on, we're going to worship It's a real joy to have Pastor Jody with us this morning. She loves the Word of God. Um, She loves Jesus so much. She's been serving in this church for, I don't know, 26, 27 years. And she's come to share God's Word with us this morning. You're going to be so encouraged and blessed. So church, no half-baked welcome to Jodie this morning. Why don't we let her know that we love her and appreciate her in their church family here. Come on, church, let's do that. Thanks, Jodie. Blessings. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Welcome to those joining us online this morning. We have already heard from God's Word this morning and been blessed, haven't we? So blessed. And as I was sitting there worshipping and sitting in communion, I go, wow, the Word of God is powerful. And what God wants to say to us through His Word in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 in this series of His light shining into darkness He's already spoken to us today. So a double measure of the Word of God for us this morning. And I'm going to read this chapter. God's Word is the most important thing you will hear today. Sit in it and soak in it and allow these words to just speak to your heart this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Therefore, Since God in His mercy has given us this new way, we never give up. We reject all shameful deeds and underhanded methods. We don't try to trick anyone or distort the Word of God. We tell the truth before God and all who are honest know this. If the good news we preach is hidden behind a veil, it is hidden only from people who are perishing. Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ who is the exact likeness of God. You see, we don't go around preaching about ourselves. We preach that Jesus Christ is Lord and we ourselves are your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let there be light in the darkness has made this light shine in our hearts so we could know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. We now have this light shining in our hearts 
But we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is from God, not from ourselves. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. Through suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be seen in our bodies. Yes, we live in constant danger of death because we serve Jesus so that the life of Jesus will be evident in our dying bodies. So we live in the face of death, but this has resulted in eternal life for you. We continue to preach because we have the same kind of faith the psalmist had when he said, I believe in God, so I spoke. We know that God who raised, Jesus, who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us with Jesus and present us to himself together with you. All of this is for your benefit. And as God's grace reaches more and more people, there will be great thanksgiving and God will receive more and more glory. That is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. For our present troubles are small and won't last very long yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we now we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. Heavenly Father, this is your word recorded by the Apostle Paul and preserved incredibly to speak right into our hearts today. And God, we are fragile class of jars of clay um, as we hear this word, Lord, but your power is great to do a mighty work in us, to bring this gospel alive to us again and to shine your light. In Jesus' name we pray, amen powerful words. And I'm gripped as I read this letter that Paul wrote by his passion. Do you know someone who is passionate? Does someone come to your mind when you think about passionate people? Pastor Peter does a pretty good job of being passionate, don't you think? Arousing us to the passionate task of spreading 15 metres of mulch this week. I am going to be there. Passion, passion is this feeling of intense enthusiasm for someone or something. Maybe someone comes to your mind as you think about passionate people. I have to say that even after all these years, when I think of someone who is passionate, I still think of Steve Irwin of Australia Zoo fame. Is anyone with me? That man had passion. And if you have come to the country, to this country in the past 10 years, or if you somehow missed The Crocodile Hunter, you need to look it up on YouTube. This man had passion for everything wildlife, but the object of his most intense enthusiasm was crocodiles. Crocodiles. The thing about passionate people is their passion is infectious. You might be experiencing now if you live with someone who is passionate about football and in the midst of this footy season, you just can't not watch alongside them. Their passion draws you in. Steve Irwin influenced a nation of people to love crocodiles. Maybe not love. Highly appreciate these incredible creatures that God made. This is passion. Passionate people never grow tired of pursuing and talking about the thing that they love, the thing that drives them and motivates them and consumes them. 
They take every opportunity to share about it and every conversation leads right back to it. And in the same way, as we read the writing of Apostle Paul, we are gripped by this passion that he has for the gospel of Jesus Christ. It drives him, it motivates him, it stirs him. It kind of just comes out in ways that it's, it's like his pen can't keep up with what he's trying to express. He can't contain it. This incredible message of good news. It spills out over the pages of this letter through 2,000 years of history to be received by another generation today as we study God's Word together. Can you relate to Paul's passion? He says, I am never going to give up sharing this message, never going to run out of the enthusiasm I have for it. Maybe you're here today and and you don't really get what the big deal about Jesus actually is. Maybe you're here today and you can remember a time when you were once enthusiastic and passionate about Jesus, but now you're much more mature and contained and you don't get carried away anymore. If Paul was here with us today, if he could stand on this platform, he would want you to know that Jesus is the biggest deal there ever was and is and will be. And there is every reason for us to get fired up and carried away with this message of the gospel that he shares with us. This chapter is a crescendo of the incredible message of the gospel that Paul has already been talking about, that we have already heard over these past few weeks. Last week, it was this new covenant poured out, the glory of God revealed in Jesus. The freedom that we live in, the freedom of life that has been given to us by the Spirit, incredible. And here, as Paul goes on with what this gospel, this good news is all about, he says, at its foundation is the mercy of God given to us the mercy of God we've been singing out about this morning, sharing in as we took communion together. You know, and and I think this picture of mercy is hard for us to, to get our head around because most of the time we think we're pretty good people. But mercy says that at one time we were offensive to God that we sat in darkness and God could not stand to be in the presence of the sin in our lives. You know, if I, if I was trying to think of an example of this, of what mercy looks like, if I had a gift today um, to give out to someone and James Harwin burst in through those doors And he said, Jody, I deserve that gift. I have been here since 7 a.m. this morning. I have been working all week to make sure the booking system's happening and the hand sanitizer's out and the iPads are charged up and there's volunteers to sign us in. And that people, especially those pastors, are signing in with those COVID things. He chases us up. He would deserve that gift. But that wouldn't be mercy. Mercy. If I decided to go up just randomly to someone who came this morning, someone I didn't know, had never met, and I gave them a gift, not, that isn't even mercy. That might be a picture of God's grace and kindness given in that gift. But mercy goes to the point of stepping through a fence. It would be me giving the gift to the person who didn't want to come to church this morning, but was dragged here kicking and screaming and forced to sit in here. And then when they saw Pastor Jody get up on the stage, they started standing up and ranting and raving and going, she is my least favourite preacher and I never want to listen to her. And it would be that person receiving my gift. 
mercy extends through the offense. It, it, it's, it's poured out when, when it's far from what we deserve. In fact, we deserve death, something very different to the life that God has given us by the gospel that is in Jesus. This is mercy. Paul knew this mercy in his own life. He was once the guy that was tracking down and persecuting Jesus' followers. He knew what it was like to live under the veil of darkness that the God of this world had blinded him in. He had stood beside Christians sharing their testimony. We can read about that in Acts. He'd heard the message of good news, but it was absurd to him. And then one day on this road to Damascus, the light literally blinds him. Jesus comes as this incredible light appearing to him. He encounters the transforming power of this light when he deserved something very different to that. That is mercy. In God's mercy, his light comes into darkness. You know, the very first revelation of God's power that we can read about in the Word of God is this light breaking into darkness. And Paul, Paul mentions that in this passage. He doesn't want to lose um, that on us to know that he is the God. The, the work of his hand is light breaking into darkness. Isaiah the prophet, whom Paul frequently quotes, says that a day is coming when the people in darkness would see a great light. And Paul makes it clear here in this gospel that he says that Jesus is that light. Jesus is the glory of God. This light was manifested in Jesus. The kingdom of God, the light of that kingdom, breaking into darkness as we see the power of God enter the world. Everywhere Jesus goes, that light breaks through darkness. The light is evidenced in the power of Jesus as he overcomes sin and death. And in his resurrection life, he gives life to us. In verse six, Paul says, for God has made this light shine in our hearts so that we could know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. And I love how personal this gets. I love that this isn't just a cosmic battle of light and dark that's happening in the world. Paul, Paul says the light of God comes right into the deepest part of who we are. That's where his transformation is. That's where his love and truth come to change us by his powerful light. God's passion flows, Paul's passion flows out of knowing the incredible mercy of God. I think it's worth noting here that the God of this world blinds our minds. Our minds are not where that gospel transformation starts. And, and sometimes when we get frustrated with trying to engage in these spiritual debates, we wonder why people don't get it. And God says here that transformation starts in the heart. Hearts are impacted by love. And as hearts are transformed by the love of God, grace and truth flows into every part of us. You know, just this week I was in the office and someone came in for a meeting and we were waiting a little bit for this person to be free. And this guy said to me, did you know why I came to know Jesus in this church eight years ago? And I didn't know this person very well. And I said, no, I didn't know that. And he goes, well, yes, I did. And then he proceeded to tell me how it all happened. 
And he said that he worked in um, the bank, in a bank with John Denton, who comes to this church. And they're in a meeting and the meeting finished and it happened to be around Christmas time. And John Denton just casually said, don't forget the reason for the season. And this guy said, those words just stuck in my mind. I had no idea what he was talking about. Why would he say that? And it was about a year later, still thinking about those words, that he got back in contact with John Denton and said, hey, do you remember me? What did you mean when you said those words? You, it's the reason for the, what's the reason for the season? And John told him about Jesus and invited him to come to church. And as that man, over the next weeks and months, sat in the back of A2 Auditorium, the light of Jesus broke into his heart until one day he prayed the prayer to receive Christ. And I could see as he told me this story of his coming to know Jesus that it was still fresh and impacting for him. He didn't need a second invitation to tell me that story. It just flowed out of him. It had transformed his life and changed him. I could see Jesus in his face as he told me about it. That God in his mercy would reach out to us, would open our eyes to this incredible truth of who he is. That he would die for our sin. That he would, through his resurrection life, make us alive in him and give us life for eternity. The very heart of God brings this truth alive in our hearts. This is the best news. Don't you just want everyone to know it and experience it too? Can you remember back to the time when this first became real for you? And if you haven't had that moment, don't leave today without experiencing that light, receiving that light for yourself. You know, I don't actually always feel like I'm bursting at the seams with passion to share this message. David Twig, I'm really sorry to say that out loud on stage. I feel like he's just going to come up here and take over. But I don't. I know this message is truth and, and I want everyone to know it, but I'm kind of awkward in the passion sometimes. And, and I think that this comes from not feeling like I've got it all together enough to share this message. I kind of think that maybe when I'm living this perfect life that Jesus made possible for me, then the message of Jesus in my life will have a bit more credibility, a bit more authority. But Paul says here in chapter seven that now that we have this light shining in our hearts, we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is from God, not ourselves. And I needed to hear that this week as I've struggled with some of the things and the call that Jesus has for me because I feel fragile. I feel, I know what it is to feel like a clay jar. You know, I think we come from the perspective that if you have a precious treasure, you kind of keep it in a beautiful box. Maybe Royal Dalton would be more appropriate to display a precious treasure than a clay jar. But in this paradox, and there are many in the kingdom of God, God sees things very differently to the way we do. He knows that we're fragile. And he says we are perfect to hold this treasure because fragile clay jars don't distract from the treasure that they hold. God is saying that in our weakness, this treasure perfectly points to his power 
and his glory and his transforming light and work in the world. Do you know that is so freeing for me? It takes the pressure off that I don't have to be consumed by how perfectly I could communicate this message. We don't have to be worried about that. We don't have to be worried about getting it all theologically perfect and correct. We don't have to have the perfect life to live up to this great treasure that God's given us. He uses fragile clay jars, ordinary everyday vessels to shine the light of his power in this world. This message is not about us. Paul goes on to point out the messiness of the suffering and the hardships of life. They are part of life. And yet for Paul, this is opportunity to display the power of God. The good news is not about how clever or resourceful or skilled we are. It is about pointing people to the power of God that is available to us in our weakness, in our troubles, in our hardship, that he is the one who is strong. He is the one who fills us with hope. He is the one who has the power to change us and the circumstances around us. He is the one who carries us to holding on in the midst of the suffering and hardship. Paul is so open about his struggles. And it's quite amazing how vulnerable he actually is. And he does this to illustrate the point that he is a fragile clay jar just like we are. We can't put this man up on a pedestal. We can't say, oh, well, that's the Apostle Paul. I'm nothing like that. He has I struggle alongside of you. And yet this is the power that I know. The reality for everyday life for Paul is that he feels pressed in on every side by troubles. But the reality of the power of God that it doesn't crush him, amen? And he goes on, he's perplexed but not driven to despair. He feels hunted down, but not abandoned by God, knocked down, but not destroyed. In the struggle, the power of God is real. Paul sounds like he's going through a lot. And yet, at the end of this passage, he says, oh, these troubles are just light and momentary. And maybe you think, well, Paul probably hasn't been what I've been through. Paul's probably not facing what I'm facing. Listen to what he shares at the end of this letter, chapter 11. We can read about some of the troubles that Paul's going through. He says, I have worked harder than anyone. I've been put in prison more often, been whipped times without number and faced death again and again. Five different times the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked, once I spent a whole night and a day adrift at sea. I have traveled on many long journeys, I have faced dangers from rivers and robbers. I have endured many sleepless nights, been hungry and thirsty and often gone without food and shivered in the cold. That's quite a resume for hardship and struggles, wouldn't you say? Not what most of us would class as light and momentary. But even this, in the light of the glory that Paul is, has fixed his gaze on, none of this even comes close to comparing what God has set before us, church. The life and glory that is in him. What are you going through right now that highlights your weakness but manifests manifests the power and the glory of God to carry you through it? Paul has this incredible perspective on suffering which seems so different to ours. Paul accepts that suffering is a part of life 
and that we are not to be overcome by it. He reminds us that in our weakness, we have opportunity to magnify God, to point to his strength and power, to be totally dependent on him. Paul says that suffering reminds us of what Jesus endured in love for us. And in this way, it brings us closer to Jesus, closer to understanding what was paid for the gift of life that has been given for us. Death is a confronting reality for us in this world. And Paul here speaks that death is just another opportunity to grasp hold of the reality of life that we have in the power of this gospel. I was reading this week about the daughter of some missionaries to the Congo Republic and she recounted a story of being a little girl when they celebrated 100 years of the gospel coming into this tribal area. Speeches were given and music was played And then right at the end of the day, this very old man from one of the um, original tribes stood up in front of the crowd to speak. And he said that when the missionaries first came, the people thought them odd and their message suspicious. The tribal leaders seeking to test the missionaries slowly poisoned them to death over months and years. Children of the missionaries died one by one, but the missionaries stayed and proclaimed the gospel even as they died. The old man commented, it was as we watched how they died that we decided we wanted to live as Christians. Our faith is real in the struggles and the hardship, the reality of the eternal life that Jesus has made possible for us is magnified as we face death. The power of God is at work and Paul says, even as our bodies are wasting away, our spirits are being renewed every day. We are fragile clay jars that hold a great treasure. You know, one of the things I read as I was learning about clay jars this week was that when they're empty, they're very easily um, chipped and cracked. They're fragile. But when they're full, they don't actually chip and crack as easily. The pressure of what is in the jar actually strengthens it. You know, we might be fragile clay jars, but we are filled with the power of God. And as we're filled in the power of God, he does amazing things in and through us. In our weaknesses, power is made perfect. We are not limited by the fragile vessel that we are as we contain this powerful message. You know, after I listened to the testimony of the guy who came into the office this week, we were talking about some of the incredible things we've seen God do in this place. And he kind of turned to me and said, what do you think makes this place so great? And I don't know if he was looking for me to say that, oh, it's all the great people God has placed here. It's all the hard work we do and as we serve together. I don't know if he was thinking that the answer would lie in the incredible wise leadership that God has blessed us with over this time. But all I could think to say was that the work of God in this place is only by his grace and mercy poured out on us. We have fragile clay vessels. We don't have it all together. This is not our glory. 
This is the power and glory of God on display, church. Praise him. Praise him for that. It is verse 15 that spoke to my heart as I was reading this passage this week where God says to me and to us this morning that his grace is yet to reach more and more people. There will be great thanksgiving and God will receive more and more glory. He has done great things in this place, church, but he is not finished yet. There is more to come. And we have the privilege to be filled with a passion for what he's doing again this morning, to be part of this kingdom plan unfolding in our midst, in our community, in our city. As we keep praying for revival, as we open up community hubs to reach more people in op shops and coffee shops, as we continue in the vision of purchasing this venue in the city, This is all about God's heart to pour out more of his grace, to see more of his people impacted by the light of Jesus in the midst of darkness. And I want us to be encouraged this morning, renewed in our passion and enthusiasm for what God is doing and will continue to do as we love him and let his light shine through us. Let's pray together, church. God, this message is for us this morning. It's your word and it speaks to us. And I'm conscious here this morning, God, that there are some hearing about your mercy, knowing the light of you, Jesus, shining into their hearts and needing to take that step of saying yes to you, calling you Lord, declaring the power of your presence and your transforming work in their life, God. And I pray that as your light comes, that you would overcome the barriers and obstacles and the questions and the doubts, God, and reveal your heart in these hearts. Lord, there are others here this morning who identify with the struggle and the hardships and and feeling like fragile clay jars. And I pray, God, for the transforming power of your gospel to meet them this morning, to remind them of the truth of life in you renew their spirits this very day, God, and continue to pour out your spirit on them. Encourage them to know, God, that they don't have to give up. They never will give up because you will never abandon them. You'll never let go. They are crushed but not overcome, God. Comfort people this morning, God, in that place, I ask. And God, for others of us, I pray that you would just fill us again with this passion for your gospel. Lord, may it well up. May it compel us, God, to speak who you are. May it overflow out of us and and be woven into our conversations and actions. and, And as your light pours out through us, God, we pray that the transforming work of the power of your gospel would touch this world, would reach more and more people, that many, many more would come to know your incredible love and grace. Oh God, pour out your mercy again today, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Church, we're going to sing together now and even just as you hear these words and and soak in God's word, sit in it this morning. Ask the Holy Spirit to come and speak to your heart, fill you again with a passion for the gospel, knowing this incredible good news that we are privileged to live in. If you want to stand, stand. If you want to take a moment to sit in this, sit in this, but respond to God's word today as we worship Him again. In Jesus' name. 
Here we soak in the fragrance of heaven this morning. Are we not blessed? Are we not blessed? And so, if you don't know the wonder of Jesus, then I just invite you to come here this morning. This morning down the front, Pastor David's here, Pastor Jerry, they'd love just to share the goodness. We'd love to give you this gift as a a beautiful gift from the merciful God who loves every one of us. For those that are online this morning, if you've heard the Holy Spirit speaking to you, you just press that button that's on the online services there and we'd love to be in contact with you. God bless you. And so church, let's be filled with the light of heaven as we go into this week, filled with his power. I love that, what Jody shared. Fragile clay, Joe's jars of clay, I'll get it out. But oh, filled, filled with the glory of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Oh Lord, that's our prayer this week. As you go before us, Holy One, these weak, frail vessels, but oh, Almighty, you indwelling us, it's beyond our comprehension, Lord, but it's true, it's true. And so, Lord, thank you for the beauty of this morning, to sing your praises, Lord, to listen to the the life-giving words revealed to us in Scripture. Thank you, great God. I want to thank you for communion shared together. I want to thank you, Lord, for the fellowship of the body. Oh, God, God, you are the life, and what a life. And this is forever, praise God, praise God. So we give you our thanks this morning. How beautiful to be in your holy presence, mighty one. We love you and worship you always, our King. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, so good to have you here this morning, and those online as well, lovely to have you too. And uh, those that are here this morning, just remember you've got special responsibilities left yet. Don't you go charging off unless you have to, of course, but just stay around. We're meant to encourage one another in the things of God. When we've heard the Word of God, let it just guide our conversations right now. Be a blessing to one another as we join together now. And for those that are online, will you find somebody to bless out there this week too as well? You Make sure you're involved in that. God bless you. So church, wonderful to be together. Why don't we just thank our God? Isn't it good to be together? Come church, we've got to do that this morning. Let's be a people of passion, loving our God always. God bless you, God bless you, and God bless you. Well, thanks for joining with us for our service today. If you sense God speaking to you, we'd love to help you on the journey of faith. You can reach out to us by emailing hello at bridgman.org.au or if you have a prayer need, don't forget to email us at prayer at and we'd love to pray for you. Thanks so much for sharing with us today and we look forward to connecting with you again soon.